Hi, this is Eric Smith. Uh, this is the second part of a uh, video that I did before. I was going to do five videos on why we didn't trust the Lord, or why um, Christians don't trust the Lord, and five reasons. And I was going to do a video for each reason, but the fifth reason was so long I decided to um, divide it into two videos. And if you want to watch the first part before you watch this, that would be um, advisable. Um, the, the fifth reason, and I'm just going to recap really quick, is we actually like or we enjoy certain sins, worldly ways, and unbelievers. And in the first video, I went into worldly ways and unbelievers. And I wanted to leave certain sins for this video here because uh, certain sins that we gravitate to or enjoy is probably the number one reason why we don't trust the Lord. And when I say trust the Lord, not only in his providence, but also we don't trust his word because our trust first and foremost begins with the word of God. So I want to go over some verses with you that is, I hope will encourage you not to gravitate or enjoy certain sins. But first, um, let's go to what the Bible says about sin. Uh, 1 John 3, 4 says, uh, it defines sin as the transgression of the law. And the law of God can be wrapped up in uh, God's Ten Commandments uh, that we see in Exodus. But the transgression or the breaking of God's law is really what sin is about. It's breaking it in thought, word, and deed. And Romans 3.23 um, says that we all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Now, the Greek word for sin itself um, means to miss the mark. It means to miss the mark of God's perfection. Because nobody is perfect but God. So our sin is below the perfection of God. So we want to get a, a sense of what the Bible says about sin and why gravitating and enjoying certain sins would be um, just a grievous thing to God. But many times it's not a grievous thing to us. We just, you know, now don't misunderstand. There are sins that can beset a Christian and there is um, no way that a, a Christian um, is going to be sinless. Um, there's no such thing as sinless perfection um, for a, a believer in Jesus Christ. But the Bible does say something about Christians that do sin a lot. And it may be a sign that you're not even truly a believer if you're sinning and there's no change in your life. But for Christians that do sin and gravitate towards the same sin, uh, we need to look at what the scripture says about this. So I want to go through, a, uh, um, through some verses, um, a set of many verses, and I want you to see what God says about Christian sinning. And you'll notice when I read these verses, they're all going to sound similar. So I'm going to start at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. The word of God reads this way. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Um, that's verses 9 and 10. And verses 11 says, and such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We're going to get to verse 11 uh, a little bit later in this video. But in verses 9 and 10, you notice that anybody that does any of those actions are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Those particular sins, that is how God sees you. He sees you as those sins. So if you're... Lying, he sees you as a liar. If you've murdered, he sees you as a murderer. So when you read this list of sins, God says anybody who does that 
is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I'm going to go to Galatians 5. Whoops. Went past it. And I'm going to read verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Touch the language is the same. There's a list of sins. This is how God identifies you as a sinner, an unrepentant sinner, and you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I'm going to go to Ephesians 5.5. 5. It says, For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Same language. Let's go to Colossians 3, 5, and 6. It says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, I may mispronounce the word, so I apologize, uh, concupiscence, I think, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. <clears throat> All of these verses are basically saying the same thing. If you're sinning and you do these particular sins, you're identified with those sins and you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now these verses are in here to remind the Christian of one key truth. If unrepentant sinners are doing these sins, and this is how God identifies them, and their sins are going to literally send them to hell because they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God, then as a Christian, why are you doing the very thing that are going to send sinners to eternal punishment? It's just a reminder, we shouldn't be doing those things because God has delivered us from those things. Now, again, it doesn't mean sinless perfection, but we should have an attitude towards sin the way God does. And the more we grow in sanctification, we're going to have the same attitude towards sin that God has. So, let me read a very encouraging set of verses that tells us our position in Jesus Christ as it pertains to sin. And I'm going to go to Romans 6. I um, have quoted these verses and read these verses to so many believers um, that are having struggles because these verses remind us who we are in Christ, our position and the power God gives us. Romans 6, I'm going to read verses 1 all the way to verse 14. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Catch that? For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin, now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, die, from the dead dieth no more. Death had no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, 
but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members of instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. These 14 verses in Romans uh, chapter 6 are telling you a positional truth that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to go over some of the, the promises here. It says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You notice that? You no longer have to serve sin. Jesus said in John 8 that whoever commits sin is a servant or a slave to sin. But Christ can set you free. And when he does set you free, you no longer have to serve sin. Um, death has no more dominion over Christ. So, because uh, he, he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Jesus Christ died for our sins. So now sin has no power over us. That's why it says, Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. See, we have the power to do that. God knows your struggles, and God knows that you're tempted. But he's telling you in these verses that you actually have the power to say no to sinful desires. It says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. See, sin, your sin nature doesn't leave. But right now in this verse, it says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. So sin does not have to reign in your body. It's still there, but it doesn't have to rule you. You have the ability to say no. It says, neither you, you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Do you know that you can yield your body to sin? but you also have the ability not to? See, many times as Christians, we sin, and we just think, I can't help but sin. It's just in me, and I have to do it. But that's not what the Bible says about you and your position in Jesus Christ. Sin may vex you, and you may be tempted to sin, but you have the power and ability that you never had before to say no to sin and not to yield your body to sin. In fact, even better than that, not just to not yield it to sin, but to yield it and, and submit it to righteousness. So, let me read a few more verses. Because your sin nature in the Bible many times is called the old man. It's the old man. You're a new creature in Christ. So, let's go to Colossians 3 again. Turn back. When I was reading Colossians 3 before, in verse 6 it said, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. It named all of those sins in verse 5, and then verse 6 it says, The wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience because you're disobeying, and you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But check out the next verses after that, after verse 6 in the which you also walk some time when you lived in them. See, that's a past description. But now you ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of, out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Hear what God's saying to you in his word? You have put off the old man. You can put off those actions and have put on the new man. That's your new nature. You can actually put it on like clothes, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So we have an encouraging word there. And the first part of those Colossian verses in 5 and 6 talks about whoever does these things is their children of wrath. their children of disobedience. God's wrath abides on them. But that's past tense. You're no longer that. You have the power and the ability through the Holy Spirit 
and the truth of God's word to say no to those things. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 basically says the same thing. So, I know I'm reading these verses and it should be an encouragement uh, to Christians, but someone might be listening to this and going, yeah, I hear you reading all those things, and I know that's what the Word of God says, but I just can't help it. See, that's the first mistake. You can help it. And many times it has nothing to do with helping it or not helping it. A lot of times is we just love to do those sins. We just gravitate towards those sins. We enjoy them. And here are some things you can do to help you through those struggles as a Christian. First, you have to confess that you enjoy the sin to God. Confessing it, not just with your mouth and lip service, but in a quiet time, confessing it to God, telling them, telling, excuse me, telling him why you're doing that particular sin. You can, a lot of times Christians don't do that. We'll say, Lord, I know I sinned and forgive me. But we don't take the time to go, Lord, I really enjoy doing that sin. I like it. Let me tell you why I like it. I just, I just have to do it. Let me tell you why. That's confession. Confessing to God that you love to do something that he hates. Until you do that, you're just going to do lip service to your sorrow. It's not true repentance because you're not telling God why this is why I'm doing these things. You can ask for forgiveness over and over again and then turn right around and gravitate towards it because you never confessed that you really love it. And you know what? You should be grieved when you start talking to the Lord that way. And I mean go into detail. Like if, if you're just angry at people and you have pride, tell God why you have pride. If you're someone that's stuck on porn, talk about why you like watching it to God. Get into detail with them. You start feeling ashamed and you start comparing that to what God, God's word says. And that's the second thing you should do. You look at what God says about those sins in his word. Look at the consequences of those sins in his word. Compare it to your love and enjoyment to it to what God says. If you do this and the Holy Spirit's in you, you're going to start feeling convicted. And third, if God convicts you of it, now you can repent. You can really repent and ask God for forgiveness. Godly sorrow. And then the fourth thing, you do everything by God's grace to avoid that sin. And you know what? You can do that. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee youthful lust. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, evil communications corrupt good manners. In other words, <laughs> bad company corrupts good morals. You can do all these things. So you can just go, well, you know what? These are youthful things, uh, lusts that I used to chase after. Let me avoid those things. Let me abstain from all appearance of evil. Not just evil, all, even if it appears to be bad. You know, let me not get around the wrong type of people that's going to encourage me to sin. Let me tell you something. Before the Lord saved me, I drank for 20 years. I flee youthful lusts. I don't go out to bars. I abstain from all appearance of evil. I don't even... Listen, I remember I was taking some cans back to the supermarket to get, you know, my five cent refund from, uh, for all my cans. And as I was in the supermarket parking lot, I saw an empty can, an empty beer can. Now, I could have added that to my cans and then just, you know, renewed them. But I thought to myself, what if another Christian sees me sticking an empty beer can and getting a nickel for it? It might not seem like a big thing, but they might actually think that I just drink beer in my spare time. See, it was an appearance of evil. So I didn't even use that can. I just abstained from it. And then it says... You know, bad company corrupts good morals. 
don't hang out with unsafe people that are doing those things. Go back to the first video. Many times we're being unequally yoked with unbelievers and we're just hanging out with them and then we're doing what, what they're doing. We're, we're not to be hanging out with them like that. We're not to have that type of fellowship with them. And once you start doing all these things, and it's a daily discipline, it's a daily practice. Once you start doing these things, you're going to sound just like Psalm 51. I'm going to read it to you. This is David's repentant prayer about his grievous sin concerning Bathsheba. I'm just going to read the first four verses. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Do you notice what David wrote or sang in the psalm? He says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David sinned against a lot of people. But in his mind, his sin, his grievous sin, was against God. When you understand that your grievous sin is against God and God alone, above all things, then it's going to convict you about enjoying it. Because God hates it. And if you love the Lord, you're going to hate sin too. And the more you start loving the Lord and you grow, in that love of God, then you're going to find yourself hating those sins that you were gravitating to. And that you know what? And then you're going to trust the Lord more and more every day because his word is lovely, his word is truth, and his word is going to guide and direct you into righteousness and holiness. And those things that you once loved, you're now going to hate. And the thing that you hated before, you're going to love. And you know what you're going to love that you hated before? Holiness and righteousness that only comes from God because you love God. So, this is the last video. I may do another one, I don't know. But for those five things that make us not trust the Lord, let me just recap them. Sometimes it's difficult to trust someone we can't see or hear physically. The second thing is we actually don't trust what God says. We think we have a better way. The third thing is we don't trust what God actually does, attributing it to three things, impersonal forces, others, or ourselves. The fourth reason is we don't trust God based on our circumstances. We let the circumstances override our trust. And this fifth reason, we actually like and enjoy certain sins, worldly ways, and unbelievers. Examine yourself against the word of God and these five things and ask yourself am I in any of these categories and I truly believe all Christians are in those categories but you know what the more we we're praying to the Lord reading and studying his word having fellowship with other believers um, just loving what God loves and hating what God hates we're gonna trust him more each and every day I appreciate any of you who have watched these videos, I hope they have been an encouragement to you. I don't always, um, can't always articulate myself well, and I apologize for that. But let the Word of God speak to your heart on these things. We want to trust the Lord above all things, particularly through these times, because it's going to get more and more wicked out there, and we are the light of Jesus Christ to the world. But we're not going to be a light at all, or we're not going to shine our light, I should say, if we don't trust the Lord and we can grow in our trust in him every day. So I hope these videos have been edifying, and I thank you so much for listening and watching. And until we do some other videos, God bless.